Reminded me to put my phone on. Don't worry, I'll make the full announcement to everyone else anyway. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So here we are, so just almost and two minutes early as well. Um, nice, great crowd. Um, welcome to the Royal Society, the UK's National uh, Academy of Science. Uh, my name is Jamal Khalili. I'm a professor of physics and professor of public engagement in science. And that, that means that I, as, as, lo as well as my, my day job as a theoretical physicist, I do tend to venture out and, and, and talk to and think about uh, other areas of science. I am not an expert on volcanoes. So uh, that's not an area I have hitherto uh, looked into. So <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to this as, as, as much as anyone else. Um, before I introduce uh, tonight's speaker, I'd like to run through just a few short housekeeping announcements. Firstly, can I ensure everyone has their mobile phones switched to silence? I suspect I'll probably have to turn mine off so it doesn't interfere with my radio mic. But feel free to uh, tweet if you so wish, as long as it doesn't make any noise. Um, uh, the other thing is there are no planned fire evacuations this evening, so if you do hear the alarm, okay, in the event of an alarm going off, uh, it's the, the real deal, uh, and you would uh, be asked to evacuate through the fire exits, uh, which are uh, in the front, there, uh, and at the back where you came in. Um, I also I want to inform you that this uh, evening's event is being webcast live uh, and recorded for the Royal Society's archives. Okay, on to the main event. I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Professor Steve Sparks. Now, um, Steve has been a fellow of the Royal Society since 1988, and he's a cur currently a professor in the School of Earth Sciences at the University of Bristol. Steve spent his career investigating the Earth's volcanoes and is credited with bringing the field of volcanology into the modern era by applying quantitative quantitative methods to their study. In 1995, when uh, Montserrat's Soufrier, is that how it best? Soufrier Hills. Soufrier, the Soufrier Hills volcano came to life. Uh, Steve was picked at, uh, to uh, head up the monitoring efforts uh, over there and to advise uh, the government. Uh, these efforts helped to safely evacuate and rehouse over 12,000 people and to hopefully, sustain the island uh, for the future. Steve has had quite a remarkable research career. I won't go on too long about that. I'll come to you soon, but <laughs> I just need to set, set the scene here. Steve's had a remarkable research career. He's published over 400 uh, peer-reviewed papers, uh, which have been cited between them something like 30,000 times. And for those of you who know about this stuff, that if, if it's important to you, um, he has an H factor of 99. So there's a few murmurs of uh, <laughs> being very impressed. I won't go into what that means. It's just a, an another measure of, of brilliance. <laughs> um, <laughs> Steve has received numerous awards. And earlier this year, he was awarded the, the, the 2015 uh, uh, Vettelson Prize, which is widely regarded as the Nobel Prize of the Earth Sciences. Uh, the prize is awarded for scientific achievement, resulting in a clearer understanding of the Earth its history or its relations to the universe, and is accompanied, I'm sure you're very, you're very pleased about, by a cash award of a quarter of a million dollars. Well, there you go. <laughs> Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Steve Sparks. Now, the format of the evening is that I get the chance to, to chat and quiz with Steve and ask him various questions. Uh, and then at some point, when I run out of questions, we will open it up to you, to the audience. We have roving mics, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll try and get through uh, as much as we can. But we have plenty of time. Um, OK, so I wanted to start with, with something, because you sent me this, the first chapter of this ebook that you're one of the editors on. Uh, you're, you're the lead author. This is a new open access book, Global Volcanic Hazards and Risk. Um, obviously, I didn't read the whole book. I'm not, I'm not that keen, you know, but I, did, I thought I'd do a bit of homework before, yeah. <laughs> before I had the chat. Um, and so I, so I read that first chapter. And the one, the one thing that struck me when I first started reading it is that one in 10 humans on the planet, about 800 million people, 
live within 100 kilometers of a volcano that has the potential to erupt. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that, do you find that, do people find that a surprising figure? It, it is surprising. I mean, it's, uh, of course, if you go to a country like Indonesia, which has 147 active volcanoes and very, very dense population, uh, uh, when you think about a country like that, it's perhaps a little less surprising, or a country like Japan, um, with a, a very dense population and a lot of <laughs> volcanoes. So it's not too surprising. It, it's interesting that we've only just recently realized from looking at statistics that actually uh, probably is about one volcano every uh, couple of years starts to erupt which has got no historical record. So although there's about 550 odd volcanoes with, which have erupted historically, and, uh, there's actually 1500 active volcanoes around the world. Uh, so the majority of them have not actually had been experiences by humans in terms of the written record. So it means uh, it's quite common for volcanoes in very populated areas to start erupting with, where the population has no previous experience. So those are, I think, some you know, fascinating issues. And as we have a more mm. crowded planet, a more vulnerable planet, then uh, uh, volcanic risk is in some ways going up. And of course, there are also the examples of volcanoes that do constantly erupt and yet you know people they, they carry on living they on carry there. on living yes exactly yes it's, it's remarkable i mean some volcanoes like etna erupt most of the time yeah. and people have lived there and they get inconvenienced from time to time i but was going to uh, ask you about i was i was in sicily earlier this yes. year and my, my first visit to, to, to sicily yes. i recommend it very nice yes. nice wine nice food and um just the the, the taxi the cab driver driving us from the airport mm to our resort, yeah. he was pointing out the villages mm -hmm. on the coast. And yes. he said, oh, yeah, that one, yeah, the, the lava reached it and destroyed half that village. That village was all yep. destroyed. Yes. And this one, all, just about. And you know, as though that's just yes, what it is. It's just something they get used to. They get used to and they go back and uh, repopulate because it's a nice place to live and lots that's of true. natural resources. <laughs> so it's, it is, uh, I, I do find it remarkable how quickly people get used to actually living on a, an active volcano and adjust their lives around it. I mean, in, uh, in Sakurajima in Japan, they, they actually get, when, they, when the volcano produces ash, people go and sweep it up and leave bags of ash outside their house for the, if you like, the municipal authorities to collect, oh. and they get some sort of tax break on it. So they... <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so. I mean, how, I mean, volcanic eruptions, clearly it's a, it's a hazard that people um, live with, but how does it compare with um, other natural disasters, natural hazards throughout human history, for example, in terms of human life loss? Yes, I mean, it's actually quite small. Uh, there's, um, we know of about 280, th over the entire history, about 280,000 people have lost their lives from volcanic eruptions. And uh, over half of that loss of life is actually just from five events. So uh, on the whole, most volcanoes erupt and people get used to them and they know how close to be to the volcano. So it's just the odd volcano, often ones which haven't erupted for a long time, which catch people by surprise, and that's where you get the really the mass casualties. So from that point of view, uh, they, they don't really compare, volcanoes don't really compare with, for example, earthquakes or floods, uh, much, much greater losses of life from those, those sorts of natural hazards. On the other hand, they do cause an awful lot of economic disruption um, mm. and livelihoods disruption. Uh, so the effect of an eruption can affect a population for maybe years or even generations. So, uh, so uh, I mean, I think we all know about the Iceland eruption mm. of being you know, left in an airport with no, yeah. nowhere to go. And uh, so they, do, they can have the potential of disruption. And as I say, because the population, it, we're living in a globalised community uh, world with, um, much, with higher populations, the risk is going up. I read somewhere a year or two ago a list of, of the, uh, the big, the outstanding problems in science. And one of them was earthquake prediction, mm -hmm. the, that we still, you know, are not very good at <laughs> doing <laughs> that. Um, but it, are volcanic eruptions in they're, a similar sort of thing, or are they better? Are they're we better, better basically. Um, and that's because the build-up to eruption uh, is often takes place over... Uh, hours or days or weeks or even months 
and uh, we're getting better. We're not by no means perfect, but we're getting better at anticipating. I wouldn't use the word forecast, I'd use the word anticipation right, right. of activity. So you can tell when a volcano is misbehaving and uh, very often, and uh, in many cases, success, uh, scientists have been really quite successful at giving warnings and people moving out of the way. Uh, I'll give you just one example. Um, in in um, t- uh, 1991, the volcano Mount Pinatubo in uh, the Philippines had a gigantic eruption, an, an immense eruption, probably uh, one of the two or three biggest of the 20th century. And uh, something like 300,000 people were evacuated. Probably of those 300,000 people, probably about 30,000 were evacuated from close to the volcano, and had they stuck around, would almost certainly have been killed. And the death toll, although the tragic, was ended up as about uh, 300 people. So, uh, and that was really because the scientists in the Philippine Institute and the US Geological Survey had noticed things going on at the volcano. They'd interpreted these things correctly and they managed to get most of these people evacuated within a few days of the really big eruption. So those are su- reasonable mm. success stories. They're not stories you hear very much because you tend to hear about often uh, natural hazards disasters when things go wrong rather than when they go right yeah, so it's when, not yeah. so um, you can think of the Haiti earthquake and you know terrible loss of life and uh, 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 terrible disruption um, on the island uh, so you hear less of the cases where things actually went right but there are examples and 50 years ago, say, or a century ago, we wouldn't have presumably been able to make those predictions or the... Or the no, uh, and it's, it's a sort of incremental thing. It's a, it's a combination of technology. Uh, I mean, uh, just one example, we can see volcanoes from space and we can make measurements of them from space. So when a volcano... Before a volcano erupts, often the pressure underneath the, gr- the ground, underneath the, the volcano is going up, and the ground starts to uplift and deform before the eruption. And uh, so from satellites, you can use radar images to take (coughs) images of the topography of the volcano on perhaps uh, over a few days or a few weeks. And then you you look at the topography and you take one topography from the other and you find the difference. And you realize that it's quite common for volcanoes before they're up for the ground to start lifting up. That happened in Iceland again before the, uh, the mm. eruption, so people knew something was going to be happening. So there's, that's an example of a technology. So what's that, and what you were talking about, what, a few metres? Or oh, no, a millim- you know, sort of millimetres, centimetres, sort of... You know, the radar's yeah. 10 centimetres, so... They're, they're bouncing a radar yeah. off the ground and measuring the timing, yeah, presumably. That's right, yeah, but if that's it's right. And these are of the order of wavelength of 10 centimetres, so it means... Incredible. You can, and, and they're beautiful, actually, when you see the patterns for the scientists who do this sort of work, you see these what are called interferograms, which is one topography from another. And they're like sort of fringes, Newton's rings, fringes round the volcano. Uh, and you can start making from the... You can say how much the volcano is lifting or the volcano is swelling before the eruption, and you can make some deductions about what's going on under underground. So those are examples of technology. There's lots of others, but... Volcanic gas, for example, we can detect much, much better than we could even two decades ago. What's been your uh, main area and contribution? I mentioned in the introduction that you, you yeah. know, you're one of the people who has brought this yeah. into a, the quantitative uh, era. Yeah, I suppose uh, in a nutshell, uh, I've always been interested in how volcanoes work, the physics of volcanoes, why they erupt when they erupt. And so I've been interested in uh, understanding the flow processes. I mean, there's two aspects of volcanic eruption. One is uh, uh, where there are volcanoes, there's molten rock underground, and that molten rock and the gases it carries, the volcanic gases that it carries, have to make their way to the surface, and that's what causes an eruption. And so the the flow processes that go under under the ground, which have always interested me, and then once the stuff gets up and gets to the surface and explodes or forms a lava flow, um, uh, then those flow processes themselves are very interesting. Uh, when there's an explosion, you get something like um, a gigantic explosion cloud, a bit like a cross between a very large bonfire and an atomic bomb cloud, which rises up into the atmosphere. 
And uh, that's, I suppose, one of my earlier contributions was to understand the physics of that process. And, uh, and, and in fact, why, it's an interesting question, why do you sometimes get a volcano that explodes and sometimes it just produces <laughs> lava, which is relatively mm. harmless? So those, those are the sorts of ideas I've, I've, I've become interested in. Well, I want to ask you later on about how we yeah. do these measurements yes. and, and, yes. and how, how you judge yes. the, the strength of, a, of an explosion. I did want to ask you first about, and this is sort of a populist question, yes. probably born from yeah. watch, watching too many overhyped documentaries on TV, super volcanoes. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> yes, right. As long as you don't think that's too... <laughs> no, 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 no. But, I mean, it's um, crept into the scientific literature. Yeah, it, right? well, yeah. And the, um, the, yeah. the Yellowstone caldera yes. and the Yellowstone mm. National Park. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if people have heard of this. It's, it's, it's you know, the it, Yellowstone is basically the, the one big... The doomsday volcano. Yeah, sort of, if yes. that were to erupt, yeah, then, yeah. you know, forget it, the end of yeah. mankind. Um, you know, how much r risk is there involved in one of the super volcanoes actually it's one of the, the one of the areas i've been interested in a, a long time and one strand of research uh, that's occupied quite a lot of the last 10 15 years is looking at the statistics of volcanic eruptions and so what we can do is we can look back at the historical record of volcanoes and we can look back the geological record of volcanoes which of course takes us along much further back in time and then we can look at that data and we can ask the question how often does a volcano like Yellowstone erupt in the world and it's quite reassuring because the answer <laughs> comes about that a, uh, an eruption of the size that formed the Yellowstone what's called caldera which is a gigantic crater probably happens on the earth every 30,000 years or so that's what the statistics tell you and that's rather reassuring because, you know, human history is 3,000 mm. years odd. The chances of this generation having a super eruption uh, is very, 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 uh, really pretty remote. Geologically, the Earth's four and a half billion years old. So there have been a lot of mm. eruptions in Earth's history of that scale. But uh, from a human dimension, it's probably not too much to worry about. Well, it's one, one less thing to worry about. I mean, it, well, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, we scenarios. shouldn't exclude them. Um, <laughs> they, uh, what's, I think, a more interesting question is, is um, when you, as you go down in size, you go up in frequency. So uh, if you right. go to an eruption which is about 10 times less than Yellowstone, then you start to get into the sorts of eruptions which maybe we should be worrying about in the same way we're worrying about meteorites coming into the earth and causing problems. The same sort of probabilities. Yes, that's right. right. So if you, if you look at um, the biggest eruption of the last few hundred years is Tambora in Indonesia in 1815. And that eruption is something like a tenth, a bit less actually than a tenth, probably about a, a twentieth of the size of a Yellowstone. And yet that caused global effects on climate, on the environment, uh, of course had devastating effects in Indonesia. Um, so though it may be the sm somewhat smaller ones we should be more concerned about, but still big enough to cause, you know, the, if you like, regions and pos possibly global consequences. And how do you measure, I mean, when we talk about the size of a volcanic yeah. eruption, how big, I mean, it, I mean, how much lava flows, how high it, it yes. throws stuff up yeah. into the air, how much yeah. ash or dust is produced. I, I mean, there's two measures. Um, one is the magnet, what we call the magnitude, and that's simply the amount of stuff that comes out of the ground. So, um, you know, if, um, if you took Yellowstone eruption, it's around one, th if you can imagine a cube, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, 1,000 cubic kilometers, <laughs> that's how much came out in the Yellowstone eruption. So that's an awful lot of stuff. The Yellowstone volcano, I think it covers the, the whole of caldera. London in a couple of hundred metres. If it erupted in the centre of London, and I'll warn you of one's coming up, by the way. <laughs> it won't be nice. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, if, it, if an eruption like that occurred in central London, spread itself over, over oh, actually greater London, it would cover London in about 200 metres of hot ash. So it's just gigantic. So that's our one measure. Right. The other measure is the rate the flux, uh, it, it's how much this, the, uh, mm. the, the rate of energy released by the volcano. And that's also measured in 
volumes of how much uh, we usually have cubic meters uh, per second. And um, you know, just to give you an idea, I guess this, this room may be 50 by 10, so that's 500 by, uh, say, 30 is 5,000, sort of 15,000 cubic meters in this room, let's mm -hmm. just say. Mm -hmm. uh, in Mount St. Helens in 1980, uh, about that amount of material was erupted every second for several hours. So that's an intensity. It's how much stuff comes out of the ground. And so that also affects your understanding. It's not just the, amount, the total amount, it's the rate it comes out. And there's also this thing called the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Oh, Is that yes. a bit like the Richter scale for...? No, it, it, it isn't, actually, unfortunately. It's, it's been used in that way, but right. it's actually... Um, it's a, an index system, which is based, because we don't have very good records of most volcanoes, um, you, you give it an index which relates to how big you, roughly how big you think the eruption, was it a five or a six or, or a three? And it's a very rough and ready tool, and we're trying to actually displace it because it is, uh, it's, it's not a very, it's, right. it's a bit of a rough and ready index. We'd rather have it in real, you know, how, ma how many kilograms of stuff came out to the volcano right, right, would be right. a much better measurement. Um, so just getting sort of ma uh, 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 slightly mathematical for a moment, it's um, the volcanic explosivity index is a sort of ordinal system mm -hmm. of numbers, which right, means yes. you can't do statistics very easily on it, whereas the size, how, much, how many kilograms came out to the volcano is cardinal, so you can do statistics on it. And... We, th we think about uh, the, the, the dangers of a, a erupting volcano. We think about the, the lava flow, which mm. you know, flows down the, the sides of the volcano and just destroys everything, burns everything in its path. Yes. We think about the suffocating mm. ash. Um, those are the main hazards, I guess, of a, an erupting volcano, but they're not the only ones. Isn't it? Poisonous gases and Poisonous things like that. Poisonous gases, carbon dioxide um, uh, is an example. Um, been, there was a, a horrible... A disaster in Africa and Lake Neos in Cameroon in the, the 1980s, where some carbon dioxide came out of a, a volcano, and, and it, carbon dioxide is a dense gas, so instead of going up in the air, it just flows down. Of course, people caught in that would be suffocated. So gases can be a real problem in some situations. Uh, but as you say, the, the the two big hazards, the ones that cause the most loss of life, one are. Um, one is a direct consequence of a volcanic eruption, which is called a pyroclastic flow. And the best way of describing this is it's like, a, I'm sure everybody's in the audience has seen snow avalanches where snow comes off and it forms a sort of powder flow which goes down the mountain and, uh, and, uh, ski and causes hazards to skiers and so forth. A pyroclastic flow is like that. It's caused by an explosion in which the material goes up in the air, but it's too dense, so it... Uh, it has to collapse and it has to flow down the side of the volcano. And these flows can move at 100 or 200 kilometers per hour, and they're several hundred degrees centigrade. So if you're in the way, you've really got no chance of survival. This is what did for people in Pompeii and mm. Vesuvius, for example. Um, and so that's, that's probably that's one of the big problems. Um, the other one is sort of less obvious uh, until one starts uh, uh, thinking about the, the issues. There are a lot of volcanoes in the world where we get um, what are called, it's an Indonesian word called lahars, it's a volcanic mud flow. And basically during volcano, there's lots of circumstances where you, a volcano will have a lot of loose debris on it. And if it, if it rains intensely uh, during the eruption, then all this stuff is... The, there's a flood down the volcano and it gathers together all the debris and tree trunks and bits of rock and flows and it gathers energy as it flows down the volcano and it forms these mud flows which can go a long way, they can go 100 kilometres easily. And uh, the biggest tragedy of the last um, few decades was a town called Amero in Colombia and a volcano called Nevadas de Ruiz. And in 1985... Uh, it, it, there's a slightly different circumstance. This volcano is very high in the Andes and it had an ice cap on it and there was an explosion on top of the volcano and the hot material landed on the ice 
made the ice melt very rapidly, mm. and then this water poured down the volcano, gathering everything in its path, and then uh, the, the poor people of Omero were, uh, were, were not warned about this, and the flow came into, town, into the town and buried the town, so the 25,000 people lost their lives. So that, and of course, that's a motivation for the science, yeah. of course, is to avoid those sorts of things happening in the future. Mm. Um, so those, that's the other big hazard. There's been a lot of loss of life associated with these uh, mud flows. And can you get that just from, I mean, the fact that volcanoes tend to have steep sides? Yes. Uh, so even a volcano that isn't erupting, if you get a lot of rainfall, yes. for instance, that would cause that mud flow? Yes, you can. And in fact, there's some you know, good cases, uh, Casita in Nicaragua, I think, uh, I can't remember which, was it Hurricane Mitch, but one of, again, a volcano, a young volcano, but not erupting, but just a steep mountain with a lot of loose volcanic debris on it. And the hurricane came through. There were some of these flows that I've described. And again, uh, uh, several hundred people were, were killed from that. So again, that, so it can be a hazard even outside. Even without an eruption. E even without an eruption. Now, um, in 1995, the Soufrière Hills volcano eruption essentially rendered half the island of Montserrat in, in the West Indies um, uninhabitable, including the, the capital, Plymouth. Yes. Um, what happened there? And uh, talk us through it, and, and indeed your role in, in, uh, in going and working there. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting case. Montserrat was, had not had an historical eruption. It's colonised around 1635. Um, it was an empty island before there. And... Um, so there was no experience, and what happened was that, uh, of course, this is in retrospect, it wasn't, that, uh, what happened was that there was movement of molten rock, what we call, geologists would call magma, up from depths, probably depths of about 10 kilometers or more. And this magma forced its way to the near surface, and the volcano started to deform, and there were little earthquakes. And some of this activity went on for about three years. Uh, it started in 1992. And then the eruption started in 1995. So it was completely, for that population of people, it was completely unprecedented. They had no experience before of an eruption of that kind. In the end, the eruption went on for a long time. Um, it, the last activity of the volcano was about 2010 and it's still murmuring away, and we're not absolutely sure it's stopped yet. So it was a, mm -hmm. turned into a very long-lived emergency for the people of Montserrat, and it threatened their livelihoods. It had huge economic impacts. Uh, and so um, it was a, a remarkable situation, both as a scientist and somebody who wants to apply the science, because... Uh, it's an overseas territory of the UK, one of our, like Gibraltar or Hong, oh, formerly Hong Kong, yep. till 1997. Uh, but uh, it was an overseas territory at the time, uh, and still is, so it's formerly part of the UK. So the British government had responsibility for managing the emergency. Um, there was no real scientific infrastructure, though colleagues from the University of the West Indies had some, one or two instruments on the island. Uh, so it was a remarkable uh, experience. I spent a lot of time there, particularly in the first three years, um, rotating in as a chief scientist of the observatory, uh, working with colleagues mostly from the, uh, the University of the West Indies and the US. Uh, but it also became very apparent and quickly realised this. This is a fantastic opportunity to really understand the science and document what was happening. So it was um, both helping with managing the crisis, protecting people's lives and livelihoods, and at the same time learning a huge amount about how the volcano worked. And so that was fantastic for me because um, I um, quite quickly got PhD students and postdocs working with me in the observatory, uh, and working with the as part of the observatory team, and particularly in the first few years, we just made fantastic observations, scientific observations, which I think have materially advanced our understanding of volcanoes generally. So what have we learnt then from, from Montserrat? 
Uh, I think we've learnt uh, one of the things that's most fascinating is that volcanoes act in a rather sort of pulse-like way, episodic way. Uh, we quickly realised that there was not just one, if you like, clock within the volcano, there were several mm. politely interacting. So we had cycles of activity every few hours, cycles of activity every few weeks, and cycles of activity every few uh, years. And those cycles uh, merited trying to understand what was causing the cycles. So uh, now the cycles are good because if you, have a, if you have a pattern of activity that's regular enough or predict, it can become predictable. So even if you don't understand what was causing these changes, you could use it to manage the crisis and right. warn people not to go into the volcano under... Uh, uh, um, or, or actually, we were able to actually anticipate some of the eruptions that happened, or the more intense eruptions. But it also led to really some big questions about how volcanoes work and what was regulating these patterns. And, and, and that was great fun mm. because we, we got into um, areas about how systems, uh, complex systems interact. And uh, we were able to... Uh, for example, um, uh, just to give you an idea, there's um, an idea about uh, uh, the way populations of organisms, animals, work, that uh, if you get a, a particular species, which, you know, a lot of deer population, which grows and grows and grows, uh, that those sorts of populations that grow too fast or too large will have crashes, and then you'll have a sudden a disease will come in or predators will come in or whatever, and you'll have a population crash. And we, we were able to use mathematics to describe, that describe how populations behave to describe how our volcano was behaving, and we managed to get insights into what was regulating the volcano. So that was really exciting stuff because it was not just getting great observations from the volcano, but also working with colleagues in mathematics about uh, the underlying physics behind this. I was interested when I was in, in, in Sicily, went up Mount Etna, and you imagine a, 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 volca a nice yeah. you know, regular volcano with a crater at the top, and you realise there are these multiple craters, you know, there's the 2012 crater, yes. there's the yeah. 2010 mm -hmm. crater, uh, and, and so, you know, pressure builds up and it presumably it, just, it finds the weakest point in, in the surface of the Earth to, to, for the magma to escape. Is, is that part well, of this, this clock, this, this, these yes, cycles? Yes, it, it, it's exactly. I mean, uh, 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 perhaps a good example. I'll give you an example, um, which will be... Um, but one of the things that drives volcanoes is gases. And um, if I can make a, just a little bit of a, a detour to give you... Uh, uh, a very popular experiment that I've sometimes done at schools or uh, for students is... Uh, to take a, a bottle of lem fizzy lemonade and you take the top off the bottle and you say, I'm going to get this lemonade out of this bottle without touching it. And so it's, and so it's just sort of sitting there as a bottle of... Bottle of just mm -hmm. bottle. And what all you do is you drop a little bit of a teaspoon of sugar without touching it and it goes down through the... the into the lemonade. And the lemonade is... has carbon dioxide gases dissolved in it, and the sugar triggers the growth of bubbles. And so what happens is the lemonade basically fizzes up, and a great big, if it's in, on a good day, you can get a jet of bubbly lemonade going up. We've all seen it on up. YouTube now. It's Mentos. You use. Yeah, a Mentos, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> now, OK, so that's a bit of a detour to answer your question. But So in other words, volcanic gases are very, very important. And one of the discoveries, I think, that contributed to is... Uh, I remember earlier on we said, well, why do some volcanoes explode and mm. some don't? And uh, is it something to do... And what we found was that the, the magma itself, the molten rock, wasn't any different in the ones that exploded and the ones that didn't and produced lava. And so, really, it's a question of... As the volcano comes up the sort of... What we, uh, the tube or the... supply the pathway from, from maybe a few kilometres deep, as it comes up, it's got gases in it. And if it comes up too quickly, those gases can't uh, escape, and therefore it gets to the surface and it explodes. But if it 
comes up just a little bit slower, then some of the gases leak up, leak out, and that makes it more difficult for it to flow, so it gets, slows down even more, and more gas goes out. We have what we, in science, describe as a feedback mechanism. And so the gas comes out, and all the gas escapes, and we get a lava flow because all the gas is gone and it's not going to explode. Right. So, that, that's, so that's an example where the, the, the physics is basically, can the gas get out, find escape, a way out, yeah. find a way out on its own, or does it stay with the molten rock and cause an explosion? So those are the sorts of things. Mm. And of course, um, uh, I won't go into great detail, but maybe uh, I wrote a paper, I think the one I sent you, that we published in Nature a few years ago. But um, I think most people in the audience, well, perhaps not everybody in the audience drinks Guinness, but if you've, <laughs> if you've drawn a pint of Guinness, uh, you'll probably notice that if you've got a really good Guinness, not a bottled, it doesn't work with bottles, but it has to be good draft Guinness, preferably in Dublin. And uh, as it's drawn, you'll see it, it forms a foam, and you see sort of wave, you've probably seen sort of waves going up and down uh, as you draw the pint of Guinness. I think it works with other beers, but Guinness is definitely the best. And that's because the gas bubbles and the liquid are separating, and the act of separation causes waves to form in the, in the Guinness. And those waves, uh, if we come back to the volcano, if you've got magma with gas bubbles in it, it's the same sort of situation. And when this magma comes up, that same sort of process takes place, and we can get pulses of explosions. We can get... OK, so... so uh, uh, so those are the sorts of things, and so you get some very intriguing physics associated with uh, how gas separates from a liquid. Oh, new physics obviously applies to everything. It's the fundamental yeah, of science. Course, yes, of course, yes, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, um, I want to talk about the Icelandic volcano. I want to give our... I want, this is a challenge for you up there to see if you can uh, spell this. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to have a go at trying to pronounce it. So it's... AF Yakel to Yakel. Yes. No, I'll, I'll try again. AF Yakel to Yakel. No. I, that, well, can you do any better? Oh, well, I call it Aya for short. Aya. <laughs> okay. Aya. And that's as nice. Well, if there's any Icelanders in the room. Are there? <laughs> ah, right. Okay. okay. So can we you... could get the right. <laughs> AF at Murphy. Is it? It's at the end, it's the L and a T mixed up together. Yes. Anyway, so um, apologies. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, it was in the news a few years yes. ago, and of course, with the, uh, yeah. measured with the ash cloud and, and, mm -hmm. and grounding all the, all the aircrafts. Um, have we learnt our lesson? I, I don't mean about the volcano, but in terms of the. the, the the problem with the ash cloud. We, we have, and we can illustrate that very nicely. Um, uh, I guess quite a few people in this audience were probably affected by the 2010 Iceland eruption because obviously European air traffic was shut down for, mm. on two occasions for several days. And uh, I must say that the Europe in general didn't get that terribly right at the time. Um, and uh, uh, the, the problem... The actual problem was this, that a very successful um, international uh, mechanism for dealing with erupting volcanoes had been developed by the aviation industry, which was called zero tolerance. You simply didn't fly where there was any volcanic ash of any kind at all. So you just stopped flying. Now, that's in most parts of the world, that works well. But it doesn't work well where you've got the greatest density of, uh, of aviation traffic in the world, uh, you know, in the middle of the day in Europe. So the, you couldn't really adapt that pro policy. So actually, you had to find a threshold of the amount of ash in the air in which you thought it was safe to fly. Nobody had really thought that through until that eruption. And that's why it caused a lot of problems at the time, because people didn't really know how much ash was safe. Now, uh, that... We learnt, uh, I was part of a, um, a team that uh, the Cabinet Office set up under Sir John Beddington, the Chief Government Scientist mm -hmm. at the time, 
and I was part of the advisory team providing expert advice on volcanoes and so forth, along with colleagues from the Met Office who uh, knew about where the ash would go in the, by the weather and so forth. And we learned a tremendous number of lessons, scientific lessons, management lessons. And in 2011, there was an eruption um, in, uh, in the middle of Iceland, another volcano by the rather, the, uh, I call Grimsvotten, and, sort of, uh, and, uh, and uh, this sort of volcano started to erupt. And then the team of scientists in the UK, the geologists like myself and colleagues from British Geological Survey, colleagues from the Met Office, very quickly got together and started to discuss what was going on. And early in the week, it, the, I think the Daily Mail had some sort of headline that, uh, you know, it was going to be a doomsday Friday, and we, you know, we, <laughs> I think it was quite close to something, I'm not sure if, something, it was some holiday anyway that, that, that was going to be disrupted. <laughs> and uh, then within two days, the forecast was made, and the forecast of where the ash was going to go and how much ash was quite accurate, and it came about from collaboration between meteorologists and geologists working very closely together, which hadn't happened in 2010. And so the airports didn't close. There was no disruption or precautionary disruption. So uh, I think it worked a lot better. And so if there is a future event, which there will be at some point, um, then I think we're in a much better place. So is it a case of prediction and the, the wind direction and so on? Or it, was it the, the threshold for, it, for the, that was set too low for the it, It's a whole range of things. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any one factor, but... Uh, clearly, there's a structural institutional issue of a new sort of ex emergency for the UK. You have the air traffic control people, civil aviation authority, you have the Met Office, you know, about the, the atmosphere, you have the volcanologists. But if you don't have the sort of structural mechanisms for those people to get together and talk to each other so they learn from each other, uh, then you, you'll, things can mm. go wrong. And I think it was... Uh, that was the realisation that you had to have mechanis structural mechanisms for people in very different disciplines and fields of endeavour to get together. And uh, I th so I think uh, that Cabinet Office Committee was the sort of seed corn for that success. Now, you were founder in 2011 of the Global Volcano Model, yes. the GVM, um, in an international platform for vol yeah. volcanology information. Did that come about as a result of this, for instance, the Icelandic um, volcano eruption? Only peripherally. I think what we started to realise, uh, well, I think we'd known a long time that uh, the mechanisms for... There's never actually been, surprisingly, a global assessment of volcanic hazard and risk on a sort of Earth scale. And the, um, I think... It, the, the, the background is there's something called the Hyogo Framework for Action, which is an gov intergovernmental uh, response from uh, 2007 in the light of the big tsunami in Indonesia and then late, latterly things like uh, the Hurricane Katrina. The realisation that the world was now really could, could be really affected by major natural disasters. And they started a process of, of uh, the UN started a process of routinely every two years doing a global assessment. So they did floods, they did earthquakes, um, tsunamis and so forth, but they didn't do volcanoes. And we thought this wasn't a very good idea. So oh, we, we volunteered, and that, by we, I mean the whole international community of volcanologists, volunteered to do our own assessment. And so I sort of led that endeavour with a colleague at the British Geological Survey and we sort of galvanised uh, about 33 different scientists from 33 different countries, 80 different institutions to work together to produce an assessment. And uh, uh, that assessment revealed new things. I mentioned at the beginning that every two years we're going to get some volcano on the earth which hasn't erupted historically is going to erupt and affect a population. And, and that sort of information came out of that study. And we published, published that here back in July as an, as an e-book. It's actually Cambridge University Press's first science e-book. Oh, so right. we're quite pleased with that. And so this is something that's just going to be constantly uh, updated? We and... have, hope 
we're going to update that. Uh, we don't quite know. We, we're aiming to do another one in about five years' time. Um, a difficulty we have, um, and uh, it's just a really comment, uh, we rely very much on good information, data, and proper analysis of data to extract interesting information that's going to uh, affect things in beneficial ways, like hazards reduction, or disaster reduction, I should say. And databases are absolutely pivotal to this. And it's not easy to get funding for that sort of thing. It's a bit, you know, it's, it sounds a bit boring creating a database that you're just, you know, putting things on an Excel spreadsheet and doing it systematically. But it's absolutely pivotal because the quality of the information is essential. So uh, we're hoping that we can persuade people to fund database work, and out of database work comes really good, great science. Now, I wanted to move on from volcanoes. I mean, in, in recent years, you've been very active, uh, more generally, uh, mm. as, a, as a public scientist, science policy, scientific mm. advisor, and I wanted to ask you about f a few of your, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the stuff you've been involved with. So, um, you've recently ended a stint as, as chair of the Advisory Committee for Mathematics Education, ACME. Uh, that was 2013 to 2015, is That's that right? right? Three yeah. years, yes. Um, so, s mathematics, and you're a geologist. How, what did that involve? Well, um, a little bit of personal history. Um, I quickly realised when I started doing research that my own personal mathematics, I'd, I got A-level maths, but it really wasn't up to analysing a lot of the problems I wanted to solve. So the, uh, the obvious thing to do was to collaborate with um, proper mathematicians. So I've had some very productive uh, collaborations with mathematicians. I was at Cambridge in the early part of my career, so I had a colleague, Herbert Huppert, who's in the audience there and from the maths department there, and we collaborated a lot. And then I've subsequently collaborated with other mathematicians. I'm enjoying a very nice collaboration with a statistician at Bristol at the moment. Uh, so I've collaborated to, if you like, offset my own inabilities right. in this area. Uh, but I do know a lot about geology and volcanoes, so I can get the right things into the equations, uh, hopefully. Uh, so I've collaborated, and so I've always been interested in mathematics. And then the ACME, which is, for, for those of you who don't know about it, is essentially the uh, the way of providing advice to government on all things to do with mathematics education at school, so it's 5 to 19. And the committee itself is made up of maths education specialists, um, as you would expect, but the chair is always somebody who uses maths but isn't a mathematician. And so for I, somehow or other I got into becoming the chair, and uh, I've really enjoyed it because it was in a a very interesting period for British education with Michael Gove at the at the helm for most of that time and uh, responding the first time I've heard his name was mentioned in a public arena and there weren't boos and hisses you know maybe <laughs> well, <laughs> can, no 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 <laughs> give him a break now he's, well should we mention Michael <laughs> Gove <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, no so it was a very interesting uh, period and uh, uh, I and of course, it's something I didn't know very much about before I started, and uh, it was just fascinating to get involved in that and hopefully make some sort of contributions. It's interesting on a public policy point of view that um, uh, a lot of the things that a committee like that does will never get into the press in a sort of mm. overt way because in some ways it isn't very interesting. And I'll give the illustration, and by that I mean sometimes you're, you're there to stop government doing daft things mm. and persuade them that a policy that they've got their thinking of doing isn't really in the best interests. And they quietly, they hum and ah and they drop the policy. And they don't so always. Of course. They don't always, no, that's, that's <laughs> absolutely true. So they did, they did listen to us, I think that's the point. Uh, and for example, if you're taking A-level maths, you won't be doing the new maths A level in October 2015 or just starting it, you'll be doing it in, or the new maths A level uh, will be in 2017. So delaying right. so that teachers have enough time to understand the new, uh, the new syllabuses and, and requirements of the new, uh, new A level. 
uh, making it in sync with GCSEs so that uh, people starting a new A-level aren't doing the old GCSE, they're doing the new GCSE in maths. It's a sort of technical issue, but you know, if, 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 that, if, if maths A-level reform had started in 2016, there'd have been perhaps 100,000 kids taking a new A-level on the assumption of a new GCSE course. But they'd have taken the old GCSE course. So, right, right. you know, the, those are the sorts of things that we were. And then I think the thing that we hope will get off the ground, we're still not sure, is post 16 mathematics. Yep. Uh, I, again, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience will realise that only it's something like, although maths is now the most popular A level of this year, uh, still it's only about 15 or 16 percent of kids in sixth forms who do maths or more or less any maths at all um, after 16 and that's completely an outlier for our, all our competitor countries so we th thought very strongly the, the ACME and the, the maths community that a lot more kids should be doing maths post 16 perhaps not a level standard but certainly do continue with maths and so there's a new course called core maths which is being introduced by the government uh, which hopefully will take off, and so a lot, an awful lot of more kids will be, have some continue their maths uh, till they get to university. So it's even those who go to sixth form to do arts and humanities, who, who, who really wouldn't want to do A level maths, they no. still have some form They'll of continuing some, maths education. So, still some form of maths education. Yes. Uh, do you think that'll e equip our young people? Are they going to be mathematically literate enough? to understand the well, importance of, course, of maths it, in society? Well, um, of course, that's a complex question because, uh, I, I mean, I think one of the problems with education generally is that the time scale over which you're, you want to do reforms really should be 15 years because a five-year-old is going to be... <laughs> the kids doing A-level <laughs> were five, you know, yeah. five years old uh, you know, 16 years ago or whatever. Sorry, not the, the, the 14 years ago or whatever. And uh, it's very difficult to get coordinated efforts by government to reform education in a sort of coordinated way which is commensurate with the timescale of an individual's experience at school. And that's still a big problem, I think, in UK education. Uh, so uh, there is difficulty. So, in other words, the ability of people to benefit from a post-16 is going to depend what they did on primary school in their right. early years, what they did in key stage three, you know, 11 to 14, and what they did at GCSE. So it's their whole experience of maths education right from the word go, which will affect how easy it's going to be to deliver a sort of much more numerate post-16. And presumably governments, with their five-year term of office, want to in yes. implement changes Far too quickly. They sometimes do, <laughs> and in fact, that's probably the, the, the perhaps one of the uh, major criticisms of the Gove regime. In a, in a sense, was not that everything they wanted to do didn't make sense. There were some sensible mm. ideas, mm. of course, but they wanted to do it all in a sure, big yeah. rush. Uh, and, and then, if they and and in a rush, you have unintended consequences, you know, like people doing an old GCSE and then going on to a new A-level, as an example. Um, I wanted to move on to another uh, point. Now, I'm a nuclear physicist, so this, this mm -hmm. really interested me. You, you've been involved in advising, is it the Japanese? Um, I've advised the, uh, the UK government, Japanese yeah. government, and the US so on radioactive waste. Radioactive mace, yeah. waste management. Mace management. Mace, yes. mace management. Mace waste. Waste. Waste management. Uh, and in terms of yeah, so what we do with radioactive waste and yeah. and, and, yep. and deep burial and so mm. on. What what is what what has been your what have been your findings, your recommendations? Oh, um, it's I think the main finding is it's a jolly difficult thing to achieve, <laughs> um, because the issue is really not largely not entirely. This is not true, but it it's largely true that the technical issues are not. The issue. It's more the matter of persuading public communities. Acceptability, it's yeah. public acceptability. That's the the big issue, certainly in the West. Um, and uh, so, uh, and that's been had a very checkered history, and it goes all the way back to you know the issues of association of nuclear mm. with military in the early days, and 
mistrust of the nuclear industry for all sorts of reasons. I think we're on your TV, <laughs> maybe on your TV program. On Sellafield, yeah. Uh, on Sellafield. So it's a complex issue, and it's quite... It's, it's fascinating to me because it's quite like volcanoes because, again, the problem with volcanoes isn't necessarily being able to predict and forecast. It's what people do in response to the scientific advice. Yeah. So if you can say it's a very dangerous volcano and they don't believe you, then they are not going to go out of the way and, and move out or respond. And mm. So there's some quite surprising analogues, actually. So it's, a, it was a very, it's been a very interesting experience. The UK is still dithering, I guess. Is, is that, no, that's probably not the right yes, word. But they're thinking about what to do with, they are, with their and, waste, and the legacy waste. The, I think the UK has taken the lead from Scandinavia, in particular, because Scandinavia's probably got the most advanced response to radioactive waste management. And that's because they've nurtured the idea of uh, consulting the public. Is it Finland? Uh, Finland and Sweden. Sweden uh, right. um, uh, Finland and Sweden have both got comparatively uh, very successful programs, and that's because they've they've talked to their uh, public. They've um, also gone on the basis of volunteer com uh, communities, in other words, communities which volunteered to take the radioactive waste, and uh, uh, because I guess both of those countries have a. a you know, if you like, sort of democratic consultation is a very big part of the culture. Those those have been successful, and uh, both Sweden and Finland communities have been found which uh, are happy to for the waste to be taken. Surpri uh, well, not perhaps not surprisingly, the these are both, of course, communities in Sweden and Finland which are next to nuclear reactors. So they're used to the nuclear industry. It provides employment. So you find the public acceptance is much higher. And this is what the Finnish and uh, Swedish found in communities close to, you know, that are used to the nuclear industry. Uh, and Britain's basically gone along the same lines. We've got a volunteer uh, pro uh, process. Uh, the uh, Nuclear Decommissioning Agency is just going through a public consultation, in fact, in the next few months, which are about screening of places. Uh, um, basically, the idea is wh what areas in Britain would you not, would you exclude? It would be completely daft to put nuclear waste. My backyard is the usual. It, well, the, uh, yes, your back. <laughs> <laughs> the NIMBY. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, but on scientific, that, this is on technical, cri geological criteria. Uh, where would you be unsuitable geology or you've got my coal mines and the, mm. the coal mines might collapse and so forth. So that's the, we've gone on the volunteer uh, route. Uh, we haven't got any volunteers. That's the only slight snag yes. <laughs> with the policy. And that's been going for about a few years now. It's, is it, a, I mean, it's a, another example is, I guess, fracking. I don't want to get into talking about that, but, the, but there's, well, well, the, no. there's the scientific advice uh, that yes. scientists talk about you know, the geology and, and so on and whether or not it's, it's, yeah. it's safe or not. And then there's the, the, um, the politics and the, the emotive mm. Um, mm. reaction of the public. Yeah. How do you square that circle? How do you, how do you get to consensus? I think it's, it's, it's difficult, but it has to be open. It has to be transparent. I mean, these are all sort of buzzwords, I know, but the, the point is uh, you have to have sort of complete openness and honesty about the science and what we know and what we don't know. I think that's a very good starting point. It might not, it might, even then it might not uh, get you to the right uh, position, but um, I think you have to do, use that as a starting point. And the more communication you can give about the tech, both the technical aspects and the environmental impacts and effects, uh, the better, I think. Uh, I think Britain went rather wrong in the 1990s because it uh, attempted with radioactive waste to have a very technical engineering solution. Now engineering of course is a vital part of mm -hmm. how you deal with radioactive waste but the big issue is to engage and to persuade the public that what you're doing is really you know what the government wants to do is really so is a safe option. Now, you continue to advise the government more widely on, on, on um, disaster risk reduction. Is that the right 
Um, yes, I think that. Yes, that's right. That's the, the current. Those are the current buzzwords. Disastrous. So, so, so that's yeah. more than just. And um, because presumably, you know, I know Montserrat is a is a British yes. uh, dependency, but I mean, presumably, the, the natural disasters and hazards that we might face on the British Isles don't include volcanic eruptions. No, they include a whole pile of other. Such as what? Well, uh, I mean, I guess uh, a rare hazard, but soon there's a tsunami risk. There's obviously flood is is a major issue. Yep. Um, so there are earthquakes that are usually not very big, so it's less of a problem. Sort of storm surges, that's another example. Uh, the Thames Barrier and so forth. Uh, periods of drought. Um, mm. So there are a range of things. I mean, I'm not an expert in any of those areas, but there's certainly commonality in terms of thinking about the methods you use to assess risk. So um, I've been involved in research which relates to sort of general uh, principles of risk assessment, uh, which is not, again, not easy because you, risk means different things to different mm. people. And so the, there's again a communication issue about what you mean by risk. Now, this year, you, you became a trustee of the Natural History Museum. Yes, that's right. So what, what are you hoping to, to do there, to be part of? Are there plans for the museum? Well, this is, this is very exciting. I mean, I'm actually a, a trustee through the Royal Society. The Royal Society has one member of the Board of Trustees, and I was fortunate enough to be selected to be that. So it's a fantastic opportunity. The trustees are from all sorts of walks of life, lawyers, business people, other scientists and so forth. And uh, a Natural History Museum is a fantastic national uh, icon almost. And so uh, I've only actually just started. I've had about three board meetings so far. I'm on their science advisory committee. So I'm, I'm in the stage of learning a lot about what they do and some of the big issues. Uh, but it, it's very clear that uh, there are some big issues. Um, in, in November, we'll have the government spending review, which will affect science. It will affect uh, the finances of museums. And so uh, there's a, bit, a lot of anxiety about what the government might have in store for us. I hope, I hope those anxieties are, if you like, ill-founded, but uh, one never knows. And uh, so uh, pr protecting uh, something as valuable as the Natural History Museum, both from the point of view of public outreach and education, and science is really important. But certainly on, on the public spending review, is, yeah. the, the word does seem to be that it's going to be a, a, a flat a figure, that science yeah. is ring fest, fence, but then as a percentage of our GDP, <coughs> we seem to be dropping well, dangerously below our competitors. Yes. I mean, museums part of, um, as funded through sort of biz, uh, you know, business in innovation skills department, um, they're definitely going to get a cut. So it depends on what they managed to ring fence within that. Mm. So there's, there's issues where we won't know until November. No, so no. as I say, our fears might be ill-founded. That's but, true. Yeah. Uh, but it's, um, uh, you know, you've, if you, I, don't know, I guess a lot of people in the audience have been to the Natural History Museum and enjoyed it. It's free, uh, uh, it's of course free, but, you know, stringent finances, um, you know, the, uh, you know the, there could be risk there, we want to have free museums. Uh, there's, a co there's a cost to the taxpayer, um, and also there's you know it's a big, wonderful building. But it, in, as all in all old buildings, there are big issues which are very costly to deal with, which are you know maintaining a mm. building of that kind and build and maintaining collections. I was staggered that Natural History Museum has 80 million plant s specimens. It's something quite extraordinary, uh, but improving the quality in which those materials, some of those collected in the 17th and 18th century, the conditions under which mm. those plant specimens are kept is a really important <laughs> issue for the museum and that costs quite a lot of money to, uh, to do. But it's not, you know, if you like, uh, creating nice air-conditioned uh, uh, buildings, uh, sorry, facilities for, for preserving plants from the 18th century it isn't necessary. I mean, it, you have to make the case. You know, yes. it's against supporting it's the not NHS. As sexy as, as the, uh, dinosaur uh, bones, for, that's for example. Right. <laughs> yeah, Dippy is going on tour. Oh well, I can, uh, can <laughs> I can tell you that. So he's he's safe for the moment. <laughs> right. 
Fantastic. Well, look, I think I should stop asking you questions and open this up to the audience because uh, we're sort of, we've got about half an hour, just under half an hour to go. Um, so we do have two roving mics. Um, uh, and so if you have questions, I think you should raise your hands and see if we can come to all of you. So we have one there. And no one on the side? No one's on the side? They're all on, yeah, it's all. We have some, someone here near the front, and then we'll, we'll come to you guys in the front. Yeah. How do you... How do you measure the quantity of stuff that comes out of a volcano? Ah, good. Okay, mm. Gr great question. Damn, um, I should have asked that. Okay. Well, what you do is you get um, uh, you get a, a, a ruler or a climb to the top, and you go when the volcano erupts, it <laughs> spreads volcanic ash all over the landscape, and you go and uh, across Iceland or Chile or wherever you're working. Uh, and you measure the thickness. And then you draw up a map of the thickness, and you contour it, and you integrate it, and find the volume of material erupted. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. You also can develop some theories which are testable, which is when you have a volcanic explosion, the, uh, the more energy or the, the rate of eruption determines the height at which the cloud goes. The more powerful of the eruption the higher the cloud goes, and you can have a theory for how, what determines the height of the cloud. And if you then can verify that theory, which you can, you can find out how fast the volcano is erupting. You know, when I said about Mount St. Helens, that 15,000 cubic meters per second comes from essentially that, uh, that, that theory. And uh, you can then work out, if the eruption lasts a certain amount of time, you can multiply the rate by the time of, of the eruption and you get the amount of material erupted. So those are the sorts of methods we, we use. As, uh, so uh, it's mostly hard field work, it's sort of as they groveling around in pits and, and lakes and so, so forth, measuring the thickness of volcanic When did you ash. stop doing that and just started sending your students instead? <laughs> uh, well, I can claim I was in Chile with my two P my current PhD students, my, in fact, the last two, I think, for... Uh, uh, and we were in the Andes back in February, okay, tramping right. around, making these sorts of Excellent. measurements at 4,000 <laughs> metres, so we're still, still getting the field. Yes. A few years ago, there was an um, eruption in Indonesia, and I remember there was a local community who were very concerned that local gas and oil drilling was very mm. near the eruption and that there was doubt as to whether um, it was safe to continue with the drilling or in fact whether the drilling had triggered off the volcano. Would you make any comment on that? Yeah, I don't know the particular example, although it sort of sounds a bit like a fracking issue as well, you know, fracking triggering earthquakes and so forth and pollution of the groundwater. And so there's always this sort of intriguing issue of what triggers volcanic eruptions. Uh, there's really no convincing evidence anywhere that human activities have caused volcanoes to erupt. There is some evidence, though, that very big earthquakes can, uh, if you like, perturb. A volcano that's close to erupting anyway, and there's a big earthquake and the volcano gets shaken at, uh, around, if you like, can uh, there is some evidence that uh, really big earthquakes can tr trigger volcano er eruptions remotely. So uh, there are, if you like, external forcing, but nobody's yet produced a sort of terribly convincing case for, uh, for human... Uh, human tr well, I, actually, I, I should actually uh, recount one case which clearly was an eruption triggered by humans. It occurred in Iceland in 1976 when a volcano in the north of Iceland called Krabla erupted. And there was some drilling going on. So this, and the drilling just happened to get down to the volcanic feeder and a tiny, tiny eruption which would have created amount, enough lava to have covered this platform erupted out of the drill hole. Mm. So there, I, now I come to think that there is an, one example of something sort of a very tiny eruption triggered by humans. Presumably, if you drill down deep enough, 
<laughs> you, yes. You, well, you hit liquid rock, you hit magma. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that, you do, yes. And, 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 uh, you, you really, and that's and under people pressure. have done that, so you know, now in Hawaii they've drilled down and found some magma and, and so forth, and, uh, in Iceland, and more recently in Iceland, so, so it does happen. The um, thing actually is that most drill diameters are far too narrow uh, to allow the fl magma is very viscous, mm. and when it flows up, it'll flow up the drill, the drill hole, okay, but uh, it has a tendency to freeze and turn into solid rock and plug the hole. And uh, we know that natural volcanic conduits are usually at least 30 centimetres, more typically a metre in width. Mm. And so, you know, a typical drill hole isn't just, most likely things will freeze on most, in most circumstances before it gets to the top surface. So I think we had... Two questions, both happen to be in the front row, and then, and then we'll move back. One there, and then one there, yeah. In the history books, they always mention Mount Krakatau, which uh, was supposed to have uh, uh, cooling of the atmosphere over a generation. Uh, I gather a similar amount to what was blown off in Mount St. Helens was blown off at Krakatau. Could you just put these two into perspective? Yes. And what actually is the truth of it? Yes. Um, uh, the first point is Krakatoa is about 20 times more stuff than Mount St. Helens. It was a much bigger eruption. And it did create spectacular sunsets and some global effects on the planet. And we know when you get these really big eruptions that it puts a huge amount of sulfuric acid and sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere as very, very tiny droplets into the stratosphere. And this scatters solar radiation back into space. So you get global cooling associated with these eruptions. It doesn't last very long, two or three years, because ultimately all this dust and aerosol gets into the Antarctic poles and the Arctic poles and gets deposited, and so the atmosphere cleans itself up. But over those few years, after a really big eruption, Krakatoa being one of them, you get global cooling. Uh, I mentioned in 1815, the results of global cooling were frosts in New England in 1816, which caused, caused crop failure and caused major migration of people from New England into the Midwest at the time. So these really big eruptions can have big environmental effects. So that's the context. Krakatoa is big enough to have a sort of global footprint. When I was doing my A-levels, uh, New Island of Circe came up. Oh, yes. And I was very interested mm. in that. What I, my question is, um, what's the difference between volcanoes on the land and those under the water? They're called volcanoes. Yes, yeah, that's a great question, because actually there are a lot more volcanoes under the ocean than there are on land. So we hear all about the land ones because uh, they affect people. But uh, along the ocean ridges, of the, as uh, there's a volcano every 50 kilometres along all the world's ocean ridges, which are 40,000 kilometres long. So there's an immense number of volcanoes. But under the water, these are usually at two kilometres water depth, the pressure's very high. And so the gases that I mentioned, the pressure's high enough that the gases largely stay in solution and don't come out, so we don't get big explosions. It's only when you get to very shallow water, like Surtse, that you start getting explosions. Um, so most of the uh, world's volcanoes are merrily erupting away underwater, and we really don't notice them. But you can get volcanoes rising. I mean, um, um, Hawaii, for instance. You know, are, are, were those volcanoes that were underwater? That's I mean, Big Island, Eventually, for instance. Yes. Uh, in fact, there's a little volcano <coughs> to the southwest called Lahihi, which is just south of Hawaii, which is a new Hawaii growing on the sea floor. Right. So the, new vo the, the, the volcano everybody sees is called Kilauea, and that's erupting merrily away, and it's a very mature, mm. active volcano. But just to the southwest, there's another little volcano growing, which will eventually grow to the size of Kilauea over geological time. And poke its head up. And poke that's its head up, that's up right. Up and it's, of course, uh, simply because the, it's plate tectonics, the plates are actually moving over the source of the, that provides, supplies the volcanoes. So, yeah, there's the new one there forming there. Okay, so we have some 
And then, do we have any at the back on this side? Yes, thank you, at last. Bit of gender balance, well, not quite, but we're moving that way. Yes. Hello, our um, understanding of volcanoes on this planet is going very well by the sound of it. What about extraterrestrial volcanism and how many volcanists, volcanologists are actually studying that at the moment? Uh, oh yes, I mean, it's a, that's, a, that's, that's a great field of science. I mean, um, planetary scientists have been sort of getting images and of course visiting the moon and collecting samples from Mars and seeing volcanic eruptions on Io, the uh, satellite for Jupiter. So there's a lot going on in the rest of the solar system. Most of the, the planets uh, show evidence of, vulcan uh, of volcanism. If you, look, if you looked at the moon last I don't know how many people looked at the red moon last night, or certainly but wonderful full moon, and all the black areas that you see on the moon, they're all gigantic lava flows filling in the impact craters on the surface of the moon. So, so the dark bits are all essentially lavas. Uh, and uh, you've got fantastic examples it sort of stretches our imagination of what volcanoes are because some of the icy planets have sort of water eruptions uh, and uh, you know and satellites and so forth and io is an interesting one because io is a planet a sort of moon next to jupiter which is a giant planet and io is being generating heat and melting inside because it's getting squashed by tidal forces and that makes the interior of the planet melt. So they're absolutely spectacular volcanic eruptions on Io. On Io. So it is happening very widely. It's a, a, you know, widespread throughout the solar system. And so there's specialists in that area. The UK is very good at that. There's a lot of colleagues who are interested in that area. Um, and so it's a very active field. Could you please explain um, the phenomenon of volcanic lightning and why some volcanoes seem to produce this? Right, OK. Um, I'll do my best. <laughs> I'm, it's not... Uh, lightning is a very specialist area, so I'm not... Um, well, I think Benjamin Franklin was one of the... Was he one of the sort of founders of lightning theory? Or Yes, yes. Well, anyway... I don't know if uh, he ever did the experiment did with the, the kites, experiment. but... Uh, <laughs> but um, Anyway, uh, you do get lots of uh, lightning, and um, there's sort of some clues. A, a, a young colleague of mine at Bristol uh, worked with some meteorologists who are lightning specialists, and they noticed that, and got to get this right way around, in the explosions that took place in the Iceland volcano, whose name we all know <laughs> and can we pronounce won't very well, <laughs> I won't try to repeat, uh, in 2010, Sometimes there were spectacular lightning displays on the ash clouds, and other times there was no lightning at all. And uh, I think that the fact they found that when the humidity of the atmosphere got above a certain critical point, the lightning turned on. And it's something, and uh, as I say, I'm not a technical expert, I, I'm just reporting what our colleagues said, that it's to do with whether, when the plume goes up into the atmosphere, whether it forms ice or water. And the humidity of the atmosphere has quite a strong role in uh, governing, uh, if you like, the dynamics of the plume. And so they, they, they noticed this, and so they attributed it to the relative humidity. High humidity more uh, appears to be associated with lightning. And then they had... Uh, I think some explanations which I'm not going to try and give you because I'm not sure I fully understand them myself about charge separation in the rising cloud uh, leading to the, to the lightning strikes. So, uh, so I guess it's similar to thunderstorms but a rather particular kind of environment where you, you're basically pushing up a lot of hot material into the atmosphere. If you're interested technically, just email me, I can send you a paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have one there. Do we have any close? And yeah. Is it safe to live in Naples? <laughs> 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 well, uh, I don't know, it may not be safe for all sorts of other reasons, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I, don't know. Uh, but uh, I don't know, uh, it's... Um, I think it's, it's I mean, people carry on 
I think about volcanoes, particularly nasty volcanoes like Vesuvius, and by the way, there's another volcano which is at least as dangerous as Vesuvius in Naples on the western side called Flagrain Fields. It's much less popular, but it's actually at least as problematic to Na Na Neapolitans as Vesuvius. So they've actually got two dangerous volcanoes in the same city. So it is one of the highest risk uh, places, but uh, the, the trouble is that these volcanoes don't erupt very often. And Vesuvius stopped erupting in 1944, and it stopped having a pattern of activity which had been going on since the 1640s. And so it's gone into a new pattern, and we don't know what that pattern is, or the scientists working on it don't really know what that pattern is. And same with this other dangerous volcano. We don't have enough information. And the problem with volcanoes uh, is that they... Uh, I mentioned earlier in talking to Jim about the regularity of volcanoes. Unfortunately, they're not that regular. And um, they often adopt something which is... I'll get, try and get, give you an analogy. Uh, uh, it's, I call it the light bulb model. Uh, so uh, b bear with me. Um, if you buy identical light bulbs and put them in your house all at the same time, you know that they're not all going to fail at the same time. One will go out early, another one will come out late. It's, it's called a statistics of viable distribution, and that's the model, a statistical model which describes how light bulbs fail. And volcanoes appear from our data to behave like that. And that means that there's a really quite a wide range of repose periods in a volcano which is playing behaving properly. So they might have a regularity erupting every 100 years. But the gaps between, although that's the average, sometimes it might be 10 years and sometimes it might be several hundred years uh, between eruptions. So they, they obey the light bulb model. And that makes it difficult to predict unless you have some sort of pattern of activity that you've grown to know and love and allows you to predict. So the reason we could predict on Montserrat is it developed a pattern and we could look at that pattern and, to some extent, understand it and make predictions on that pattern. Vesuvius and Flagrum Fields, we can't do that. So we don't really know whether the next eruption of Vesuvius is going to be next year or um, in 500 years' time. If it's in 500 years' time, then I wouldn't think you, if a Neapolitan would be that worried. But we don't know. That's the problem. It, we, we just have the large uncertainty about what the future might hold for that particular volcano. What is certain is there's uh, three million people living there, and you'd have to evacuate 600,000 people from that area, even under the modest scenario of what people expect to be the next Vesuvius eruption. And that would create an enormous problem, not just for Italy, but for the European Union if it happened. So it's something we have to take seriously, and the Italian authorities, of course, are planning for that eventuality in case it happened. Yeah. Hi, you said at the start you were interested in subsurface flows particularly. It's one of the things that got you interested early on. Have you managed to use that in an uh, economic aspect, particularly with regards to the mining industry and uh, you know, well, of that ilk? Y yes, uh, that, that's a, a good question because one of my sort of most recent interests is in the formation of copper ore deposits. Copper is one of the most important commodities, uh, though you wouldn't perhaps think about that uh, too much about the, in the current value of copper, but it is nonetheless a tremendously important uh, uh, an essential commodity for long, not, uh, modern life. So a copper ore deposits are mostly, not entirely, but probably 70 or 80 percent of the world's copper comes from old volcanoes which have been eroded down to a depth of two or three kilometres, so they're extinct and that's where you find the copper ore. So uh, understanding volcanoes is very germane to both developing mines on uh, uh, copper mines and also discovering new ones so that we've got uh, copper resources for the future. Um, and copper is not just about uh, wires into your, uh, to make your laptop and computers work. It's also about copper being antibacterial and uh, it, uh, I, I've heard a very interesting talk 
that uh, when we went from brass uh, to stainless steel in hospitals, that had a link to the development of superbug. And now the World Health Organization is recommending film, putting copper films around in hospitals because of that. So copper's a really important mineral. And so I've been working uh, with my colleagues in Bristol with the mining industry to uh, understand how copper ore deposits are formed uh, using our understanding of how volcanoes work. And so we hope that that will lead to, uh, if you like, some practical uh, uh, consequences of being better at finding where the copper is uh, and mining it and uh, for the future. Okay, so we have front row here and then first here, then over there. Yeah. Hi. Um, how far in advance of a volcano erupting do you usually know that it's going to erupt? Like, when about do you start taking those... Panicking. Moments? Yeah, <laughs> panicking. Uh, <laughs> running. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's very variable, unfortunately. Um, I, I can give you the best example of a, uh, a prediction and the shortest lead-up time. Um, some colleagues of mine from the Carnegie Institute um, have fantastic instruments. What they do is they bore a hole in the ground, a few hundred metres deep, and they put something that conceptually is like a washing up liquid bottle in it with a straw in it. It's called a strain meter. And if you imagine a washing up liquid that if you had a straw on the top and you squeeze it, the liquid goes up the straw and when you relieve the pressure, it comes down. So it's a pressure meter. And this is a fantastic instrument. It can detect depressions, uh, meteorological depressions, tides and so forth. It's incredible. And they put three of these around a volcano called Hecla in Iceland. And in 1990, sometime, I can't remember, sometime in the 90s, this volcano had an eruption and they, they looked at the patterns of these strain meters and they saw the pressure building up before the eruption. And then in 2001, something like that, and I'm not sure the exact date, the same volcano, uh, they saw the, pressure, the changes in these instruments. They rang the Icelandic broadcast at the beginning of the news, and they said there's going to be an eruption of Hecla in 20 minutes' time. This was announced on the Icelandic news, and indeed it was sort of 17 minutes later there was an eruption. But uh, that's, that tells you two things. Firstly, you need this technology, and the vast bulk of the world's vol volcanoes don't have this technology available. So that's a problem. And secondly, it can be as short as a few hours. Sometimes it's, at one strat, it was about three years in the build-up. But other times, it's, it's only sort of 20 minutes. The other problem is sometimes volcanoes uh, grumble but don't do anything. In fact, that's quite common. So we also have a scientific challenge of understanding when a volcano starts having little earthquakes and the ground starts moving, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to erupt. And we have, that, that's a bit of a, still that remains a bit of a scientific challenge. I think this is probably the last question. Make it good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no so pressure I, then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from uh, Japan, which we have uh, quite a lot of uh, frequently uh, earth, uh, this kind of eruptions. Uh, for volcanoes, and actually I want to know if there is any way to also uh, prevent this kind of event uh, for having this volcano eruption, like uh, taking out this mentos or these kind of things. Is, is there anything <laughs> kind sorry, of... Take, sorry, I didn't catch the last... Uh, taking out the mentos, like uh, yeah. not yeah, having it to pre yeah, prevent I from... Guess. I yeah. think the uh, uh, prospects of engineering volcanoes has uh, uh, got a really checkered history in the 19, uh, during the Second World War, the US tried to bomb a lava flow in Hawaii, which was uh, very spectacularly unsuccessful. <laughs> um, so it's not, it's not, it hasn't, had, it hasn't got a good record. Um, uh, but in Japan, uh, Japan uh, is one of the premier scientific countries in terms of volcanology. There's some superb volcanologists, a number of institutes in Japan, including Kyoto and University of Tokyo and so forth. They're very, very good. Many of the volcanoes in uh, Japan are amongst the best monitored in the world. So in Japan, uh, uh, on the whole, you're in pretty good shape, and they've done a very good job of predicting most eruptions. You probably know about Osama 
uh, I think last year, where there were some mountain climbers killed, where there was an unpredicted explosion. Uh, and the, unfortunately, those things will happen from time to time because although it was a, t a terrible tragedy, it was really quite a small explosion on a Masama, and they just didn't have enough instrumentation to uh, detect what was going on, uh, going on. So it doesn't always work, but on the whole, Japanese, Japan's in very good shape and made huge contributions to the science. Well, thank you very much. I think we've sort of more or less come to the end, I th we didn't want to get anyone to ask any other questions in case it was a very long question mm -hmm. and answer. So I think we're probably just about it. I don't know about you, but I, I, if, we, if I'd watched a documentary, 90 minute documentary on volcanoes on TV, I'd probably glean 1% of the information content that I've, I've, I've learned this evening. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. For those who care, I'm gonna make sure I get Steve onto my Life Scientific on, on Radio 4, because this hasn't ruled out that. In fact, it's only made me more keen to, to, to have him on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Professor Steve Sparks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. And th thank you all for coming, and I hope we do this again sometime soon. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.